Hi, welcome to session one of our Bible study series entitled, Is the Bible True? Have you ever been asked that question? Well, I have been asked that question numerous times and some of my fellow brethren, family members and friends have been challenged by that concern as well. So please join us in our Bible study series to discover the truth. Our facilitator for Is the Bible True Study Series and other spiritual empowerment series will be Pastor Susan Robligian, also founder and president of Exclusive Gospel Ministries with the mission of connecting souls to Jesus Christ according to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, 19 to 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Pastor Robligin is also a student at the United Theological College of the West Indies, currently pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Arts, majoring in Ministerial Studies, and also a Certificate in Counseling. Her contact information is exclusive gospel connections, which at gmail.com, X-C-L-U-S-I-V-E-G-O-S-P-L-E-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-O-N-S at gmail.com. Just a little bit about this, the ministry. Exclusive Gospel Ministries, originally called Exclusive Gospel Connection, was founded on October 2nd, 2015, with the mandate to spread the gospel of Christ. In 2021, after enrolling at the United Theological College of the West Indies, a more rounded knowledge of ministry was attained, and thus, Exclusive Gospel Connections acquired a new name, Exclusive Gospel Ministry, and expanded into 15 different ministries. But since COVID 2020, they have been operating on a small scale, and the current active ministries are the Outreach Ministry, the Prior Ministry, the Bible Study Ministry, the Evangelistic Ministry, where Pastor Robligian currently authors tracks for distribution, and the Empowerment Ministry. This ministry mission is to empower people both on a spiritual level and on an inspirational level where you have motivational sessions which are currently posted on our YouTube channel under the name Exclusive Gospel Ministry. Five sessions have been posted so far, which is walking in your purpose after identifying your innate talents, identifying your talents and gifts. Vision goals, becoming your own cheerleader, types of goals, and last but not least, living purposefully with more to be followed shortly. Other ministries that are coming soon is Sunday School, Youth, Golden Age, Men's and Women's Fellowship, Single and Married, as well as Family Ministry, Hospital Ministry, Prison Ministry, Entertainment, and Fundraising Ministry. Now that's a wrap. Now, let us go to the meat of the matter in discussing, is the Bible true? Now, the Bible, the inspired written word of God, the sacred and holy scripture that reveals to us who the almighty God is, his character, his instructions, that also document the seven dispensation. Are we asking the question, is it true? authentication of the truth of the bible will be done in our series by reviewing ancient manuscripts biblical prophecies and fulfillments archaeology facts the authors and individual faith journey let us begin our process of authentication authentication by reviewing an article by kathy award which was published on may 17 2021 she cited three reasons we can trust the bible she states and i totally agree that the bible was given to us by god read second timothy 3 16 and second peter 1 19 21 this scripture reveals god to us it shows us God's character, his purposes, and his ways. It points the way to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, let us look at the three reasons Kathy states why we can trust the Bible. Reason number one, the Bible's miraculous preservation through history. Kathy states that, and I quote, there is more physical evidence to support the reliability of the Bible than any other Asian document that exists. And in this series, we will go through them in details. 
For a New Testament example, consider Homer Liad. Only 643 copies of the Liad exist today with 5% variation between these copies. In comparison, more than 24,000 complete and partial copies of the New Testament exist today. Among those copies, there is only a mere 0.5% variation, one half of 1%. Listen, the Old Testament reliability is just as impressive. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scroll in 1947 confirmed God's miraculous preservation. Before 1947, the oldest copy of the Old Testament that exists known as the Masoretic Text was dated about AD 900. Then, in a cave near the Dead Sea, a young shepherd boy found a collection of large clay jars filled with papyrus and leather scrolls. Now, these scrolls were full and partial copies of the Old Testament book. The oldest scrolls dated back to about 150 BC, making them about a thousand years older than the Masoretic text. When scholars compared the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic text, they found a 95% accuracy rate. Now, according to biblical scholars, that 5% discrepancy is due only to spelling differences and minor variation. Listen, God preserved his words through 11 centuries of copying. Kathy also referred an article by Clayton Carby where he spoke about the reliability of the Bible, citing four reasons. Guess what he too stated? We have thousands of biblical manuscripts. We also have archaeology supports um, to support the biblical records. He also stated that original writings were faithfully preserved and that the New Testament was written shortly after the events it records. You can read more on his webpage. Now, let's continue with Kathy Howard's reason we can trust the Bible. Reason number two, she said the Bible's messages are consistent throughout. The Bible was written over roughly 1,005 years ago by God-inspired authors and in three different languages. And yet, the Bible contains one consistent message. What is that? All the individual books and stories within the Bible join together to tell us one big story from Genesis to Revelation. We read the golden thread of God's rule, reign, and redemptive purpose. Jesus is present from the first story until the last. We call this God's big story. The presence of this meta narrative proves God's design, his control, and intent. It shows us that we can trust what God has preserved for us. Finally, number three, the Bible's life-changing impact. All scriptures of God, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. It is used for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and in training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for good works. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And also, for the word of God is alive, it is active, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's Hebrew 4, 12. God says his words not only teaches us what is right, but that it also corrects us when we are headed down a wrong path and trains us to live godly lives. God uses his words in our lives like a surgeon with a scalpel cat, he says, to get down to the heart of every issue, to reveal our sinful attitude and motivation and make us more like Jesus. I too, like Kathy, have, have personally experienced the transformative power of God's word. Everything his word promises he has done and is doing in my life. What other book can do that? Absolutely none. The Bible is God-inspired word. We can trust ourselves. It's authority. We can trust that God will use his word in our lives for his good and our glory. You can read more in depth on Kathy's website at www.kathyaward.org. Three reasons we can trust the Bible. So, what is truth? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary, 1828, as defined through as, and I quote, 
the body of real things, events, and facts. Dictionary.com defines truth as, and I quote, the actual state of matter, conformity with fact or reality, a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle. The King James Version Dictionary defines truth as conformity to fact or reality, exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be. Finally, the Bible defines truth as the word in John 17, 17, as he prayed to the Father, he said, suffice them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus told Thomas that he was the way, he was the truth and the life and that no man come to the Father but by me. John 1, 14 also declares what the truth is. And the word truth was made flesh and dwell among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the Bible? The Bible, known as the inspired word of God or the sacred scriptures, according to Joshua J. Mark, 2019, takes its name from the Latin Biblia, Book of Books, and the Greek Ta Biblia, the books. The books of the Bible were originally written by hand, producing limited copies which resulted in many ancient books being lost and the original manuscript of the Bible perishing. Let's look at the origin and growth of the English Bible. The three main copies, which are from the most ancient copies made from the original manuscript 1005 BC are the Codex Sinaiticus, 330 AD, originally codex of the Greek Bible from the 4th century, purchased from the Soviet Republic of Russia in 1993 by Great Britain and is now in the British Museum. Number two, the Codex Vaticanus, 340 AD, and lastly, in the Vatican Library at Rome, originally contained the whole Bible, but parts are lost. And this was written approximately in the fourth century. Then you have the Codex Alexandrinus, probably written in the fifth century. Now in the Britain Museum, it contains the whole Greek Bible except for just 40 lost leaves. Now we are going to be reviewing the ancient versions. There exist many versions of the Bible. So the ones that we'll be looking at are the Septuagint, the translation of the old Hebrew scriptures into Greek, 285 BC. Then you have the Samaritan Pentateuch, which is the Hebrew text extended in Samaritan characters. Then you have the Peshito or Syriac, the whole Bible. Although we are uncertain about the dates, we're thinking it might be in the first or the second century and translation of the common language of certain portions of Syria. Then we have the Vulgate. What is the Vulgate? It's the entire Bible translated into Latin language. And this was done by Jerome at Bethlehem, completed about 400 AD. And guess what? For 1,000 years, this was the standard Bible in the Catholic Church. During the Dark Ages, very little Bible translation was attempted. There were a few minor translations made of portions of the Bible. If you look at the diagram on the right side of the slide, you will see the information on the left, hide knowledge of and increase doubt in God's word. In this situation, there's limited access of scripture, use only Latin Bible, keep people literate and usurp educational system. If you look on the right side, it states reveal knowledge of and increase trust in God's word. In this situation, there's a lot of printing press, a lot of translation of the Bible, persons know how to read and there's a new educational system. 
The Bible was locked in the Latin language until 1320 to 1384 when Wycliffe initially translated the New Testament in English in 1380 from the Latin Vulgate and then he died and his friend completed the work after his death. There are a whole lot of other English translators. Let's discuss a few. William Tyndale, he translated the New Testament in 1525 and the Pentateuch in 1530. He died before completing the Old Testament. Then you have Mark Coverdale, 1535, Matthew's Bible, 1537, the Great Bible, 1539. This large version was ordered to be set up in every parish church, churches and was obtained to the reading desk. Then you have the Geneva Bible of 1560, handy in size, the Bishop's Bible 1568, used mostly by the clergy, the Dohe Bible, where the New Testament was published in 1582 and the Old Testament in 1609 to 10, which is a Roman Catholic Bible. Then you have the Bible, which most of us are familiar with, is the King's James or Authorized Version, done in 1611, which was translated by 47 scholars under the authorization of King James I of England. Now, in translating this version, the Hebrew and Greek texts were studied and other English translators consulted with the view of obtaining the best result and has held the first place throughout the English-speaking world for over three centuries. Followed after that, we have the revised version of 1881 to 1884 made by a company of English and American scholars. While this version was supposed to be a version of the authorized version, it has one distinct advantage over all its predecessors. It reaches down and touches the most ancient copies of the original scripture. Some of these ancient copies were not available at the time of the translation of the King James Version. Then you had the American Standard Version in 1990 to 1901. This version incorporates into text the readings preferred by the American members of the Revision Committee of 1881 to 5. Now, there's a lot of other versions after the English version since 1901, and we are going to be reviewing it on the next slide in the format. So, let's look at the chronological list of major English Bible translations, and you will see a repeat of some of the ones that we discussed previously in the previous slide. Now, but let's go over and look at the list. That's in the 10th century AD, West Saxon Gospels, um, earliest surviving English translation, translated from a Latin version and contained only the gospel. Right, then you have in the 11th century, you had Old English, Exotush, and it was translated also from the Latin, Latin version, and it contained, contained only the Exotush, meaning the first six books of the Old Testament. It only had Genesis to Joshua. Then in the 11th century, you had the Old English Psalter, translated also from the Latin version, contained only the Psalms, existing two versions, one in a straightforward prose and the other in stylized verse. And then in the 14th century AD, that you had John Wycliffe Bible, translated from the Latin version, the first translation of the entire Bible in English. In 1526, you had Tyndale New Testament, translated by William Tyndale, and contained only the New Testament. In 1530, at Tyndale Pentateuch, translated by William Tyndale, the first translation into English from the Hebrew text, and it contained only the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy. And in 1531, Tyndale Jonah, translated by William Tyndale, translated from the Hebrew text, contained only the book of Jonah. And then in 1535, you had what is called a covered dead Bible, Translated by Miles Coverdale, the first complete Bible in modern English. New Testament was translated from the Greek text, but the Old Testament from Latin and German translation. Then in 1537, you have the Matthew Bible, translated by John Rogers under Thomas Matthew. Mostly a composite of the work done by Tyndale and Coverdale with major edits. And then in 1539, you had what is called the Great Bible, primarily translated by Miles Coverdale, first authorized version or version 
sanctioned by the English crown, also known as the Cranmere Bible and Witch Church Bible. Then in 50, 1560, at the Geneva Bible, first English Bible translated entirely from the original languages. First English Bible translated by a committee and the first English Bible to contain verse numbers. We are seeing improvement. Then in 1568, the Bishop's Bible, the second authorized version of English Bible, went through several substantial revisions. In 1611, the King's James Version that we discussed earlier, also known as the Authorized Version, or AV, used, used the Bishop's Bible as its starting point, underwent a substantial revision in 1769, where it took the basic form it has today. Then in 1885, the Revised Version used the King James Version as a starting point and made changes to bring it in line with the latter manuscript discovered and linguistic studies. And then in 1909, American Standard Version, also called ASV, which is, which is a substantial revision of the Revised Version, especially known for its consistent use of the name Jehovah rather than the title of the Lord in the Old Testament. In 50, 1952, we had the Revised Standard Version, an often controversial translation particularly for its rendering of messianic passage like Isaiah 7:14 and Genesis 49:10 among others then in 1971 you add the new american standard bible use use the asv as its starting point considered by many to be the most literal and word for word of all the major translation underwent a notable update in 1995 update let me tell you a little bit about that Two separate revisions of the 95 NASB were released in 2020, two years um, ago. One still known as the NASB and the other as the Legacy Standard Bible. Then in 1978, we had a new international version, NIV, fresh translation, not based on any previous version, underwent significant revision in 1984 and in 2011 then in 1982 we had a new king james version based on the same greek and hebrew text as the king james version but rendered in 20th century english in 1989 new revised standard version a significant update of the rsv often used by scholars but still controversial among many churches for the same reason as its predecessor and in 2001, we had the English Standard Version used the RSV as its starting point, made significant changes based on further manuscript discovery, and corrected many of the RSV problematic passages, such as Isaiah 7:14. Then in 2004, we had the Holman Christian Standard Fresh Translation, not based on any previous version, especially known for its somewhat inconsistent use of the name Yahweh rather than the title of the Lord in the Old Testament. And in 2006, the new English translation, fresh translation, not based on any previous version, especially known for its detailed notes on the alternative reading in manuscript and, how, and on how they arrive in their textual choices. In 2014, we're coming down. You had the modern English version, a contemporary English translation of the same Greek and Hebrew text used in the King James Version. And in 2017, you had the Christian Standard Bible, a substantial revision of the HCSB. In most cases, the revision brought the CSB closer in wording to other modern translations and away from the distinctive phrasing of the HCSB. Yes! We, are, we have come to the end of session one and I'm going to invite you to join us in our next video for session two where we go deeper in the statements and the question is the Bible true? Right? In session two, we'll be looking at the Bible as described as a library comprising of 66 books except for the books called the Apocalypse books and also we'll be looking up looking at the bible as it is divided into two major parts the old and the new testament what is a testament by the way 
A testament is something that serves as a sign or evidence of a specified fact, event, or quality. That's according to the Oxford Dictionary. But And Merriam-Webster says a testament is a covenant between God and mankind. We will be looking at the Old Testament or otherwise called the Hebrew canon. Now, what is a canon? A canon is a collection of books that comprises sacred scripture or Bibles of Jews and Christians, right? The Oxford Dictionary states that the, it's also the, the authority of the Bible through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was taken into consideration the process of canonization. And the Old Testament contains 39 books and the New Testament contains 27 books. So we'll be going in detail and looking at what, what all of those books are saying. Now, and what we'll also be looking at is the 18 apocryphal books of the Old Testament. And you can see them on the screen. The Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, or Sirach, 1st and 2nd, 3rd and 4th Maccabees, Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, Esther, Prayer of Azara, and the Song of the Three Hebrew Children, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, 1st Eradis, 2nd Eradis, Prayer of, of Manasseh, and Psalms 151. How many of us thought that Psalms ended at 150? So we'll be looking at those books. And you know what persons have been saying about them, that there are different scholars, including different uh, um, acropophile books in their Bible translations before the official list, which we have today, which was sanctified by the several Roman Catholic Council and appeared in the King James Bible. And the first list is on the screen. So just to let you know, most of these books have separate storylines and characters from other books of the Bible. For example, the books of the Maccabees come after the Old Testament canon and describe the Maccabees revolting against empires that control Israel. So in session two, we will also be reading some texts from these books that are currently not in our Bible. Don't miss out on session two in our Bible study series is the bible true so join us when we go online next time and i will end this session by saying amen